Hello, and good morning, and welcome back to Automotive Logistics and Supply Chain Europe Live. Great to have you all with us again today. Um, we've had a really interesting conversation this morning, uh, looking at uh, how Toyota are managing their supply chain, and today we're going to look at uh, a, a specific session focused on Finnish vehicle logistics and dealing with continuous disruption. Uh, continuous disruption is the new normal for vehicle logistics as stop-start production, impromptu local and national lockdowns, and a new European trading environment. In this session, we'll discuss how OEMs and service providers are adapting their capabilities to scale up and scale down operations at short notice, redesigning transport networks and utilizing rail, ocean, and road to build greater resilience against the challenging, challenging headwinds of today's market. I'm joined today by Chris Godfrey, head of Global Head of Outbound Logistics of Volvo Cars and Rud Vosper, Director uh, Business Development at Inform. Um, great to see you, Chris, and, and welcome, to, uh, welcome to the session. Um, and uh, of course, let me uh, congratulate, congratulate you firstly on, on, on your new role there at, uh, at Volvo Cars. Yeah, thanks very much, Nemesh. Um It's a pleasure to be back, and I, and I say that because as you know, I, I took early retirement from my previous role and did a little bit of consulting and then was convinced um, by a, an old friend and colleague of mine that maybe I should invest a bit of time in working in a company in Sweden, being Volvo Car Corporation. And when I said yes, I, I didn't envisage for one minute that I would be starting on the 6th of April 2020 and walking into what I walked into, which was quite an interesting scenario. Um, and actually, just a, a little bit on that journey, I've done one slide on that for me, which is sort of reflects the last year in terms of my time in Volvo cars. And, and, and if the guys could bring the slide up, it would be useful. Um, please. Uh, and I think this picture as it moves through will be very telling for everybody on the call or, or on the conference today. Uh, and obviously, pre-pandemic, what we saw were officers that were, were like this globally around the world, that we were all used to. And then when I started at VCC on the 6th of April, I walked into this, which I have to say was the most surreal experience that I've ever had at, at any time in my working career, um, all the way through automotive and even pre that. Um, and actually, it, it triggered something that I, I thought might not happen for me as an individual again, um, which was a very unique opportunity to learn how to lead and drive a function in a business in a totally different environment. And, and if we trigger the next bit, it, it's this one here, the, the one that we're all in today. And, and for me, one of the main reasons I came out of retirement and came to Volvo was because I was missing the daily interaction of people, um, the teamwork, the collaboration, the, the development of an organization and its people and engaging them and empowering them to drive business. So what, what I thought I was getting versus what I got was, was quite unique. Uh, and doing the things that I just said in a virtual world are even more challenging. So I've had to learn as a leader maybe it's a full new skill set in the past 12 months of not just dealing with disruption, but doing what I said before, coaching, developing, leading, uh, and supporting the new direction, ambitious strategies of Volvo cars while doing it all remotely. And then you throw the disruption on top of that. Uh, and I have to say it's probably been one of the most challenging years of my career uh, and my working career. Um, uh, so, yeah, it's been very, very interesting. Um, I'm sure we'll move on to some of the very disruption topics themselves. Um, but one of the reasons that I've always really enjoyed supply chain and logistics, and, and especially outbound, is that one day has never been the same. Uh, and, the, and the last year, and things like sewers and Texas have just demonstrated again that it's never a boring job, which which I live for. It's great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And it's it's you know it's. It's really interesting, right? Because you know, even for for us as a business, I mean, we, we, we normally we'd be sitting there 
sitting here on stage, right, and doing this there, and, and having to yeah to to change um, change how that uh, how you change that environment is is completely alien to to a lot of people, right? And having to make that quick pivot, you know, plus for you, for, for for you and your operations, you've got different facilities in in different places, right? How do you how do you communicate with those people? Yeah, for me personally, that's been that's been a particularly individual challenge for me because I'm very much somebody who likes Gemba. I like seeing my operations. I like meeting the people that run our business for us around the world. Obviously, Volvo Cars has, has developed a lot, particularly since Geely and Volvo Car Corporation got together. And we have a lot of operations in China, which I've never physically seen or visited. And for me, as, as an OBL guy that started in operations running terminals and ports, they're the type of things I really like to see, to see where we have the opportunities to improve. Can we do things better? Can we motivate people to be more creative and innovative in what they do? And, and by the same token, I've never been to Charleston yet, other than on holiday. Um, and that was a few years ago. So I've never been to VCCH in Charleston. I've never seen the plan. And yes, I've had daily meetings with the teams, but if for me, it's one of those things that I think we've lost um, with the virtual world that we live in. This is a great example, conferencing and, and physical networking with people. I'm a very sort of tactile. I like to be in touch with things um, and people. And social media and everything else has made it a lot easier for us to communicate. But I still feel we miss a little bit of that human interaction thing. And, and for me, interpersonal relationship skills very much lend themselves to face-to-face -to -face type meetings and discussions. Uh, and I hate to think what it would have been like for all of us without some of the technological advances that were mentioned yesterday in the early session by Lars about his dad in Mexico and stuff like that and communicating by, by letter. Um, what would it have really been like yeah, for us all if we didn't have this wonderful technology? which at the same time can be slightly frustrating when the digital world starts to crumble a little bit under the weight of everybody suddenly jumping online. And I think we've all probably experienced that in our personal communications with families and, and friends as well as in work. And, you know, it, it's a unique year, which is spreading into a unique year and a half now prolonged by semiconductor and, and other things. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I think you're, I think you're absolutely right. I think uh, you know that ability to kind of switch and change and keep up with technology. You know, um, having to set up my mum uh, with her iPad to do a Zoom call with the family was uh, <laughs> remotely as well, right? Yeah. <laughs> was challenging itself, right? So and, yeah. and that, that that story that Lars told yesterday was was fascinating as well. And you, you're right. I mean. I think uh, we'll we'll come back and and talk more about the kind of the operational challenges that um, that you've had to go through. Uh, I know there's uh, probably no doubt a long list of those that uh, that we can go through. But uh, yeah, let me just take uh, an opportunity to 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 bring Rid into the conversation. I know he wants to uh, talk about some of the conversation, some of the um, uh, challenges that he's seen from his perspective. So, Rid, Rid why don't you? Um, Share with us some of your thoughts and uh, on some of the disruptions that, that that you've seen. Yes, thank you very much, Nimish. Um, I'm sharing my screen. Can you see it? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think uh, last year, March, was at the beginning that we got a signal that we shouldn't shake hands anymore when we were at a customer in France. That was a, a strange situation, but within a month, I think everyone was fully aware that there was a new normal. Um, it was not nice that we couldn't travel anymore, yeah, but the other side, uh, we also saw a lot of very blue skies, more sunshine, and it looked like that climate also got a, the right sort of positive impact from this uh, COVID-19 situation. So it was not only bad, I think, that we have learned during the COVID uh, situation. Um, Later on, we noticed that suddenly the semiconductor world got in trouble, or especially automotive industry related to the semiconductor world. And thinking back, that had all to do with all the forecasters in the automotive industry who first were shocked because of the COVID situation. 
and thought, okay, let's make forecasts which are lower than we had thought in 2019. But the interesting thing was that especially other industries like electronics, high-tech, laptops, they got a lot of extra requests. And I saw it with my daughter. We ordered a laptop for six months ago and we just received it yesterday. Yeah, so it takes so much longer also to get the products from other industries these days because of the semiconductor uh, scarcity. What's very interesting, what I've learned as well in the semiconductor world is that a company like Toyota had almost no problems uh, and understanding they typically work just in time. Yeah, but we have learned this morning, I think, from Leon as well, that just in time doesn't mean that they have not so much stock, yeah, but they should have the right stock. And it looked like they found a way to find the right stock also for semiconductors. And when you compare that with Volkswagen and GM, we have seen that they are in more trouble and that they lose at least 100,000 cars in the first quarter this year because they had not made the right plan uh, to prevent the semiconductor crisis. In the last weeks, we heard about the Suez Canal uh, problem. And looking back to that, I, I feel that this was more that there was a shock. Hey, there is a problem. And what if that takes maybe a month or two months that that ship is blocking the canal? In the end, it was only 10 days and the problem was solved again. So I feel that when it was solved, then also for most of the companies, the problem was over because 10 days is something to oversee. It's, it's, it's more the low risk than the big risk. But I think many people start thinking, okay, what can happen if this happens in the future, two or three months that the ship is stuck in a channel and what would be the consequence then? So I think everyone starts now really thinking again about supply chain and how to mitigate the risk and also wonder, should we really have suppliers far away and transport far away or maybe do things closer to home? Yeah, thank you, Britt. So that's really interesting. Um, and of course, you know, let's let's maybe bring this back to to where we first started, right? And and you know, for for you, Chris, how, how did you make that pivot, right? When you're having to face this this shutdown and and fight for space and capacity, yeah, how did you deal with that situation? I think it was really interesting because it was obviously just starting when I arrived, and and I think VCC or, or Volvo Car Corporation, as we like to call it. Um, I think we handled it better than most because in reality we were shut down for a very limited time and started up again relatively quickly. And, and I think one of the assets for us with our current size was that we weren't asking for the same amounts of things that other bigger OEMs were. So maybe it was easier for us to get parts to keep our supply chain running. Um, that doesn't demean all of the work that the procurement people had to do to get the, the stuff that we needed. But from an outbound perspective, when I walked in, because of the uncertainty, we were holding cars and looking for space, let's say, closer to home um, and not moving them necessarily into markets because we didn't have the visibility. If I think about Italy, when I walked in, we were holding X, of, X amount of thousands of cars, either in Gothenburg or in Belgium because we didn't know what the condition was. Uh, uh, and luckily, we very quickly established that, that because the rest of the world had shut down very quickly and pretty much stopped production where we hadn't, um, that maybe there wasn't the same amount of impact that we thought there could be, and holding on to cars wasn't the right thing to do. So we pushed a little harder, and we managed to reel cars down to, to Italy. We managed to push cars into the UK because we weren't seeing the, the, the real impact that we thought could happen. So maybe we reacted a little bit quickly, but then very quickly got on top of it and thought, there's still a gap and there's still space. We just have to convince people to do it. And working very closely with our supply base, and I have to, I've got to congratulate all of them. It's not been easy for any of them. Um, we managed to do what we needed to do to keep ourselves running and not come to a standstill and stop plants. It, it was really excellent from the supply bit yeah 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 i mean i think you know that's a key part of it right everybody coming together and being able to adapt together right and and, and to meet everybody's needs because you've got your challenges right but they're, they're you're not the only car 
car maker in the world, right? Uh, that's trying to ship cars. And I think I think one of the biggest issues throughout the whole thing, Namish, not just at the start, was because the majority of the other, other OEMs were shut down while we were running. Clearly, for the supply base, that's a big issue because they're not getting the return flows, their circular economy, where they're trying to reduce empty kilometres, and we're asking them to do things that aren't complementary as they normally are with return flows from other OEMs to places that we're picking up from or going to. And, and that took a lot of work and collaboration with the supply base to do what we wanted to do. Uh, and I think also the fact that we we were focusing more on making sure we were moving cars that we needed to move when we needed to move them. And our forecasting was quite probably better actually than it's ever been before in that critical time because we needed to be sure that we were for asking for capacity that was really needed. Uh, and and for where it really needed to go um and, and my team um not just here but globally we managed to do that in all of the regions so airpac americas and EMEA, um very very successfully yeah um so i think the collaboration element probably came to the fore last year and continues into this year whilst still running the business and and trying to do what we're meant to do and and I've really appreciated the comments, whether it's about semiconductors or cars. It's about moving the right cars at the right place at the right time to the right at the right time. Um, and that's never lost its mantra for outbound. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think that that, that also comes back to to kind of yeah, being efficient in, in that supply chain planning, right? And having that visibility, right? And, and maybe Rud can can uh, add here a little bit as well in terms of, you know. That those tools and the, the the ability to get that holistic view of of the supply chain, where the bottlenecks are, and what other companies are doing, and which route, routes are they they're using, so you can and again collaborate and make best use of those those the, the capa available capacity. Yes, for sure, we see our customers uh, more and more uh, seeing the needs that they have for uh, visibility. Uh, they want to be informed, more proactive. Also what uh, Leon told this morning from Toyota, they want to know where the risks are in the coming weeks, especially when uh, they already know that flows maybe in Japan are disrupted. What will happen in the next three, four weeks uh, that in Europe then, how can you prevent that uh, ports will be blocked by too many ships at the same time? So I think that's the new trend. Also, how uh, big companies try to prepare better for disruptions to come. Yeah, thanks, Rud. I think I, I think just coming back on that name, if I can. When when I came here, our planning horizon for things like deep sea was quite short and and very quickly we moved to a three months rolling period horizon for planning for deep sea and six weeks on short sea intra european um, and extending that to a three month horizon because for me that that's the sort of practice and commitment as an oem we should be making to the supply base this is our forecast for a longer horizon to understand, for you to understand what our intent is, but also for you to plan better. And, and it's 12 weeks for a reason on average for deep sea, because normally cyclic return journeys or, or, or turns between regions is around about six weeks, 42 days, um, some extension of that at certain points in time. But that's why it's at a three month period to give a level of security for what we need from a capacity point of view but also for the suppliers to understand what our expectation is. And I think that was very much appreciated last year by the supply base that we extended our planning horizons, became more focused on planning and measuring our actuals to see where, where we were good and where we needed to improve. Um, and that really bore fruit for us at the, in the end of year last year, where it, it was recognized within the company that it was probably the best that Volvo cars had ever had in terms of end of year planning and delivery, which was great. Yeah. 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 And I think that's, a, that's always been a, a, a challenge, right? Is that, is that forward planning, right? And giving yeah. the, 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 the suppliers enough visibility of, you know, what those volumes look like, right? Not, not just for, for, from you, but right across the, the other OEMs as well. And that, that, that's yeah. always, 
in the challenge. So great to see that you had the ability to to do that. I guess it's, you know, how the the other OEMs worked worked with their suppliers on that same kind of basis, or actually collaborated with other OEMs on that so on that side of things as well. Yeah, I, I think that's the particular challenge, even even during a critical or, or crisis period, if you like. Uh, um, I think we get bogged down in how much can we collaborate and OEMs tend to push the collaboration word through the supply base and expect suppliers to do that. Uh, and what we need as, as OEMs is forums that allow us to collaborate, but to collaborate in a legal way to be able to use the supply base in a circular economy way. So there's less waste, more sustainability, um, and more utilization of capacity. The industry cries out for uh, common platforms for capacity demand and supply matching, um, but it never seems to really move. Yeah. And, and it's a big ambition of mine that we have that type of capability um, from an automotive perspective. And, it, and for me, it's sort of next generation um, beyond the start of collaboration, even in forums like ECG is an example. Um, where people check the legality of what we're trying to do and, and commonality on things like EDI connectivity and digitalization can be done. But it, it's next level collaboration and what can we do legally between different automotives, but using the supply base and being in the same forums, you know, to, to really exploit um, what capacity exists uh, and the networks that exist. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And Ruth, from your side of things, uh, of course, this is something that uh, that you've done some work on as well, right? Uh, looking at uh, inbound and outbound flows, and of course, tools there to be able to kind of help visualize this. Yes, correct. So, if you are okay, then I share a few screens what we did uh, regarding digitalization and this collaboration. Is that fine? Yeah. Okay. So, a uh, first example, what we learned also in the last year is that. Yeah, the personal contact at the entry point of a factory or a distribution center was not uh, that good anymore. Uh, people want to stay one and a half meter from each other. And we learned that our solutions, for example, at factories and at uh, large car terminals were very useful. Uh, uh, trucks, they were recognized by uh, license drive, uh, license plate recognition. And also, uh, yeah, the drivers could pre-inform that they were going to certain factories. This helped them that the gates could open automatically. They didn't need to have the contact at the gate with the people. And the big benefit also was that the waiting times for the drivers was much less. And the similar we have here in Zeebrugge yeah, for ICO, where drivers enter a cabin they have possibility to get access to the system where they can say which truck they have with them and they get uh, the cars assigned that they can pick up and they don't need to talk with the people uh, to find out where they need to go in in the in the yard these elements are now very much uh, becoming more popular uh, we get a lot of requests all over the world how people can start working on the uh, e-gate. Beside that, we have uh, a lot of interest in driver apps and onboard systems so that also the visibility can be created. Um, the drivers can give hand over cars to the dealers. Um, they also can ask for uh, pictures about damaged vehicles. There is real-time information then about that the cars uh, have arrived at the dealers um, and there is no paper information needed anymore. And we have customers in Ireland who already have a full digital process eh, between port and dealer. So it's all proven technology. It all works uh, nicely. What we see now as, let's say, uh, happening in the coming years is that yeah we shouldn't think that COVID-19 is the last disruption yeah, there are more to come and one of the big things we expect is uh, yeah the climate change discussion and we've seen that in the last uh, days as well in the conference uh, yesterday time came up yeah, with this uh, picture climate is everything 
So probably that will be the big discussion in the coming years. We know Europe is talking about the Green Deal. ASEA already says, yes, we are fully supporting the Green Deal. And today, the latest news was also that now there is a sort of commitment in the EU that we should find 55% CO2 reduction till 2030. So the big puzzle, I think, is how to make it work. Uh, which pieces of the puzzle do we all need to, to go to that 55% reduction? And additional, on top of it, uh, some big companies like Volkswagen, they say, we need to manage and push that strong enough. So we possibly also need to CO2 price in Europe. Yeah, and this all maybe will lead to more push from, for example, trucks to ships, to trains, to go to intermodal, and maybe also to greener trucks. So let's see how we reach this way from Volkswagen way to zero, but also automotive way to zero. So one of the things we are studying in Inform, and I think this is an activity maybe useful for the full automotive industry in Europe, is one side we know where all the factories are. The other side, we also see a lot of new suppliers are coming up, especially in the battery world. And the big question is, okay, how should the flows in the future look like? At the moment, we understand eh, at the left side that maybe uh, only, uh, maybe 70, 80% is done by trucks. The big question is, is that the answer eh, to come to the CO2 zero question, or are there different ways? As Inform, we, we have tools in place like network planning, and this network planning it can map uh, all the factories, all the distribution centers, the emissions, and also the full supply chain. And when we use mathematics, then we can optimize all the flows in Europe and look to objectives like either CO2 reduction or cost reduction or lead time reduction. Yeah, we did a study a few years ago uh, where we checked how could we look to the network from a cost optimal view, a lead time optimal view, and a CO2 optimal view. And what you see is that the challenge is big because when you think about a CO2 optimal view, there is always a risk maybe that costs can go up as well. And I think that's the balancing act the coming years. What can we do to not only uh, find CO2 reduction, but also that we can find at the same time cost reduction. A study we did as well is to see how can we help uh, to understand this automotive industry better with all the vehicle flows which are going around in vehicle logistics. Yeah? And at the left side, you see basically all the countries who produce cars and the distribution flows to different countries. Then the question was, is there a way maybe to combine outbound flows and inbound flows and, and together find more clever transport modes? At the right side, we also can see where the engine and the transmission factories are. Then today we know that EU has been working a lot on defining all sort of corridors for Europe, where trains easily and quick uh, should go eh, from, let's say, Turkey to Germany, for example. And I think now it's the time that we map the real network with the automotive network. And what could happen is that, yeah, when we do that in the right way, we could set up a sort of metro system for the European automotive industry. Yeah, a metro system where you have fixed schedule every week for the trains that you can combine the vehicle logistics with the inbound logistics. And the greatest step would be if we can make it work as automotive, then as a next step, we could ask big players like IKEA, like Procter & Gamble, maybe to start uh, using these lines as well, eh, so that more volumes give more frequencies, shorter lead times, it could be win-win-win for everyone. So that's a big question. If we can come to such a collaboration in Europe, eh, we think there is maybe a chance to bring car makers together, battery suppliers together, logistic companies, and try to find ways how to bundle flows to complete the loads, how to find back loads for transport, how to find reduction in cost, reduction of CO2, 
and the ultimate goal is to find win-win between, between companies and also help that way to go to a more climate neutral solution for Europe. So very interested to discuss that further with you, Nimish and Chris, to see if you feel there are some possibilities in that area. Yeah, thank you, Britt. I think uh, thanks for running through that. Some interesting there, interesting slides there. Of course, looking at the flows. Um, yeah, let me let me uh, ask Chris to uh, give his thoughts on that. There's clearly some. There's a whole kind of sustainability and CO2 footprint there. Then there's that optimization of the network, inbound, outbound flows, etc. So, um, I'll let you decide which one you want to pick up on, Chris. It, it, it's uh, and we didn't plan that segue into to Rod's presentation. By the way, that just happened with me talking about collaboration. Um, it, it's it's very much what I have believed for years the industry needs to do. The biggest stumbling block to that is is people coming out of their automotive driven silos and being prepared and supportive to do that type of activity. Um, how can it happen? Uh, I honestly believe that that has to be driven by something independent by the EU, like the EU Commission or something, um, supporting, you know, the EU has been very good at launching a number of initiatives um, over the years. And I think probably the most important one could be um, setting out a roadmap for providing, not just for outbound logistics, but for cargo generally, yeah, um, a sponsored platform which is seen as independent from operators that provides the ability to all businesses, not just automotive, but to all businesses to optimize networks so that there's waste removal, there's much more sustainability. It's optimized for cost because all of us OEM people want, uh, uh, as the slide said in, in Rudd's deck from VW, CO2 price. Um, and we all want these things for, for future generations. But I honestly believe that the only way that that can be driven here in Europe in particular, let alone globally, is with sponsorship of legislative bodies to make it happen. Um, because as much as I would like to collaborate with people, there are rules and regulations that only let, allow us to collaborate up to a certain point. So whatever the tool is, it needs to be independent of us as OEMs. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's that, that's the big challenge, right? How, how, how do you make this happen, right? I think that, you know, that, that there's clearly the desire, but it's making it happen. You know. Yeah. And, and, I, and I think it has to be driven from that level, Nemesh, uh, because we all have a desire but if it's legislative somehow, then it would happen, yeah? Um, and it could be the most valuable piece of intervention from the EU Commission or anybody in EU legislative bodies to make it happen um, by providing that type of platform and capability for the transportation industry globally uh, within, the, within the region and beyond if it can be done. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess it's, go ahead, Rud. Yeah, my, my view is that up till now, the car makers always were looking to the logistic service providers to come with the collaboration solutions. But I think the, uh, the world of logistic service providers is much more fragmented than the OEM world. So uh, if there is a platform for the car makers itself eh, to work on that logistic vision, how they can find synergies between each other flows, making sure that they follow the EU rules and not go into cartel risk or so, then I think that could have a bigger effect. And because everyone is more looking to the car makers than to the logistic service providers. So I think when the big car makers could stand up, come with that vision, maybe discuss it with the EU, then we should try to empower that and see how we create a roadmap between each other and see how we roll this out in the next uh, five to 10 years. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. I think um, th th there's a couple of questions come in from the audience. I think one kind of relates to what we're talking about. So bearing in mind all of this, it, the, the question is from Des uh, Cunningham, uh, where do you see opportunities emerging from as a result of this period of disruption for both OEMs 
and suppliers, particularly in the outbound world? Is that to me? Go ahead. Thanks, <laughs> Mr. Cunningham. Uh, I, I think it's always interesting in a time of crisis that, the, and we're doing it, you know, um, we're looking at everything we do. And, and Leon this morning touched on, um, I think it was Leon this morning that touched on the use of digitalization before you have robust business processes and digitalization of maybe business processes that aren't robust. Uh, and we are actively looking at things to remove waste in our process by using automation or AI um, and going through that process so that we can free up our people to be more, how can I put it? A colleague of mine used this phrase last year when we were talking about this type of activity, ha moving people from hands to heads to become more intelligent in terms of what we're doing instead of just doing the repetitive tasks that really add no value to the business uh, for us or even our supply base uh, and using those people and digital tools on things like network design, which we're actively working on now and, and Rudd's company is part of, of an exercise where we're tendering for that. Um, for us to design more uh, intelligent networks and, and look at what the real opportunities are. And I think we're being driven by what's happened in the last year to utilize our resources, whether they're people or they're digital or, or whatever it may be, including the LSP network, to be better at what we do. And I think NVD is a good example of that. In 2008, 2009, they revamped their whole business to, to make sure that they could carry on operating as a, as a provider to, to the automotive world. And for me, they're one of the benchmarks in the industry in terms of optimization of transportation and synchronization of, of their processes to keep their assets running, which is their most valuable part of the business. Um, so I think looking at how you do things, why you do them, what's the added value of it, which is what we're going through right now, um, is something that should be happening in every company, and I suspect it is, but is it pushing it to the next level of it uh, and then utilizing that resource which is freed up to bring more value to our supply chain, but also to support our, our LSPs in, in improving their business if they're willing to do that um, in the way that they work. Um, and also listening to what they say about what we're asking them to do and does it add value or does it not add value? Yeah, I think that's very, very important. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, it's always got uh, uh, that's, uh, that's a kind of working together mentality, right? The, the, this yeah. is your solution, and yeah, we want to innovate in this way. And 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 your 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 people in your team are thinking outside of the box and thinking of these new ideas. But can you actually achieve that, right? And bringing the the LSP along with you as well in that journey. Yeah, it, and it's got to be practical. You know, if it's not practical, then it, it's. It could be something that has an end goal in an ideal world. This is where we'd like to be, but we can't move that fast. We, we, we have to do phased approaches. And, and are those phased approaches the right thing to do? Or do we work on it until a point where we can get to the ideal? So not do things just for the sake of doing it. It has to have a purpose. Like our people need to have a purpose and a clear vision of what we're trying to achieve. It's the same for the business process. If it adds no value, why are we doing it? Yeah. And, and that... For me, that should be the challenge from the supply base, not just for outbound, but for general cargo and everything else. Why are you asking us to do this? Are we justifying it as a, as a real need? And, and going back to previous rules and my new rule, which is also the engineering and network design, are we asking for things to be over-engineered instead of not being so engineered and being more sustainable from a cost to CO2 perspective, et cetera, et cetera? Um, and, and I want our providers to feel free to challenge where they think we are being extreme in what we're requesting. Shouldn't be afraid to do that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And Ruda, of course, from your perspective, you know, making this happen and you know being there on the on the integration side, right, and, and dealing with multiple parties on on getting this, there's clearly a challenge in 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 that side of things as well, right? Yes, it is. Um... We see that, yeah, by applying best practices in the industry, that that inspires uh, other companies uh, to try to uh, do that as well. 
and, and we feel also in the coming years, uh, people need to make big steps ahead eh, to reach these new goals. So they have to try to experiment and uh, learn from others very much. Look around, where are the best practices, either in uh, yeah, maybe more digital uh, supply chains, but also looking to others who are more advanced in finding greener trucks or greener transport. One of the areas that I see is maybe interesting to explore as well. I know some of the car transports are also looking how they can make uh, diesel cleaner uh, by uh, yeah, adding some other uh, substance to the diesel. And, and it looks like that gives also 10, 20% improvement. So I can imagine these days uh, it can help companies to uh, promote themselves by showing that they are one of the first in trying new things. And I think uh, the car makers are very interested as well to to work on these pilots and experiments to try them out. Yeah, thank you. I think that's really. Did you want to add to that, Chris? Yeah, I, I do. I, I think, you know, we've recently changed the way that, that we're working here in terms of our traditional model with suppliers. It, it's traditionally been when I came in, one market, one supplier for delivery and and a very limited amount of supplies from a shipment perspective and point of view. And, and one of the things we're changing is is that set up to provide more opportunity for the supply base as a whole to take part in Volvo Cars business. But one of the things I particularly want to mention is that, that, that we changed our supplier for our fast flow volumes to, to the, the port of Gothenburg um, early this year um, from the traditional supplier. Um, and we gave them a longer term contract to allow them to invest in the future and to look to change the method of transportation between the plant at, at Torslander and the port with an active encouragement to as quickly as possible get to a, a, a CO2 neutral solution um, in, in a, a relatively short time with trailer designers, truck designers shifting to alternative fuels but we gave them a longer contract than we had done previously to give them that that security in doing that. And I think as OEMs, if we're asking people to invest in these things, then we have to take a longer term view and make it more of a partnership instead of the usual cost optimized solution. And, and I suppose that links back to Des Cunningham's um, question as well. Are OEMs prepared to invest longer in supplier relationships to allow them to invest in the future technologies because it doesn't come cheap and we all know that yeah absolutely i think that's always been the challenge right of, of yeah yeah what's the long-term contract that allows you to invest in that technology right i think that's that's uh yeah and, and, a, and a deep sea provider will tell you it's 30 years if you can give me one and a truck operator will share five years as a minimum if you want me really to do something drastic. and i know these things but then trying to get that through the purchasing world as well as the business as a whole is the real trick and and I, i'd like to see openly to all the suppliers that are on there now come with the creativity come with the solutions and and request longer term contracts to be able to provide those to us as a business to help us to reach our sustainability targets because if you don't then it, it becomes more or less collaboration and more force and push yeah yeah absolutely well, I think your uh, your inbox is about to be inundated, Chris. Probably, but I don't mind. I've got a team that will look at it all for me. <laughs> Absolutely. But look, I, I know we're 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 just kind of coming to the end of time. So, uh, and I'll take a, a, an extra couple of minutes to uh, to wrap up here a little bit and uh, just ask um, ask you the final question, really. Of you know, and, and this links to uh, a, a question that came in earlier as well from from Hartmut. Uh, your colleague there, Ruth, um, looking at uh, what are the, so his question was, assuming that COVID is not the last pandemic, what are your top three measures to prepare? And I'll also add to that and say, you know, clearly you, you, you're going to take some learnings and, you know, what are those top three things that, that you're going to focus on in terms of preparation for that? But also, you know, what what's the one or two things that you'd like to see change this year as well? I I'll start with go red okay uh what we like to see change this year um 
Now, I, I, I imagine that one of the lessons that we have learned in the last year is that Toyota, for example, was more prepared on such a semiconductor supply chain problem than the rest of the industry. And I think that's a very quick lesson for other car makers uh, to study what did Toyota do, what they didn't do yet to prevent that such uh, supply chain disruption the next time uh, can be prevented. And I think what people learn now is that digitalization is step one, but the next thing is they need to be more predictive as well. They need to look uh, weeks and months ahead and uh, try to be uh, to try to make a sort of forecast how their supply chain is moving. And when I was working in the past in Nissan as well as uh, Chris, we had systems like uh, CarFlow, where we could look months ahead and see what the consequences were in distribution centers or in uh, in factory compounds based on a uh, forecast from the production. And I think these sort of tools are needed in the industry to learn and to uh, evaluate these different scenarios uh, quicker. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Rud. I think that uh, looking ahead and being able to predict what's going to happen is, is clearly there's advanced AI solutions coming coming into play that looks to that, but having the right data sets in the right place and being able to, to look at that because you know there's a vast amount of data that we're collecting, but you know, what is the data? Who's analyzing it, looking at it, and getting at taking actual insights out of it is is clearly gonna gonna help to drive that forward. Um, Chris, final final thoughts. Uh, I think from my point of view, I, I, I resonate with what Rudd's saying about moving away from being a reactive industry to a proactive one to a predictive one. We develop a strategy to do that for supply chain logistics, now supply chain management in the world of Volvo cars last year. Um, and we're on that journey. So I can I can tie in exactly to what he's saying. And we're, we're developing the tools, the, the, the data analytics and everything else to tell us and identify. But the one thing I, I'd like to re-emphasize with everybody is, and I, and I hope this resonates, um, whatever the disruption is, whether it's Fukushima a number of years ago, whether it's the Suez Canal, whether it's the pandemic, semiconductors, container shortages, and all those type of things, the one thing that makes the difference during those periods of disruptions are the people. Yeah, um, and it's our people that make the difference. And as leaders of organizations and functions, we have a responsibility to give them the tools that they need to be able to do their job whether it's working in what is now the normal environment from home for a lot of people or in an office again, we have the responsibility to provide the required tools to allow them to do it and engage them in the business process reviews, the, identif the identification of value-added, non-value-added, stripping out stuff that doesn't need to exist and be part of the idea generation for what we need to take the business to the next step of being predictive instead of reactive or proactive, but being predictive really as an industry and bring it out of the stone age from where it has been for a number of years into something that really adds value to the world. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you very much, Chris. I think that's a, that's a great note to end on. You know, while we talk about technology and digitalization and all of those things, it's fundamentally it's it's people that that make things happen right and uh, yeah. as you said you you know right at the beginning you said you, you're missing that kind of human interaction and being able to go places and see people and shake hands and uh, and that side of things we we miss that too and i'll certainly look forward to uh, to to coming and visiting you uh, in your new location now uh, it's it's been a while since i've been to uh, been up to newcastle and seen your seen you up there so uh, it's, it's a short flight away now, so I'll look forward to, to that trip and, of course, coming to see you, Rud, as well um, at some point in Germany, too. Name is you won't find me in Newcastle. I'm in Sweden. <laughs> I know. <laughs> well, I'm welcome to fly to Newcastle, but I won't be there. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, be coming to, I'll be coming to Sweden for sure. <laughs> You're more than welcome. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. And thanks. It's been a great conversation. Thank you very much for for. for for, for the conversation, the insights, and uh, look forward to uh, connecting with you again very soon. Um, Thanks, Namish. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Bye bye.